Okay. And let me get up and click that because it's going to tell me, give me the warning. Oh. All right. So I want to thank you. Everybody. You want to introduce your column, and then I'll come in after you if you introduce um, yes. the Atlantic Institute. Yes, I'm going to introduce the Atlantic Institute, and then I'll um, spotlight you. All right. Um, I'm Paula Ludwig with the Atlantic Institute. You can see our wonderful banner above me here. Um, we do uh, several classes every year. We do this one called Cuisine of Different Cultures. We do uh, cultural creations, and then we are just starting to do monthly TED Talks. Um, you can check out um, us on uh, Eventbrite, and we also have a website, Atlantic Institute, South Carolina. Um, we all are all about, our vision is of a peaceful world. And um, we find that by uh, introducing different cultures to people, that with understanding comes less conflict. And so we um, enjoy showing you these different experiences. Um, if, if you're just joining and you haven't done it already, we'd like to see where everybody's coming from. So if you can put in the chat um, where you're from, um, city, state, country, um, if you're not in the US, and um, that will be awesome. Um, this recording will be available on the Atlantic Institute's YouTube channel. It's Atlantic Institute SC um, on the YouTube channel. This will be available um, probably next week, the later end of next week. We have volunteers that do this stuff for us. Um, and you can also check out the Atlantic Institute on Atlantic Institute, South Carolina, like I said. Um, and we, like I said, we do different programs. Um, the month of July, we do what we call our inner, our, tour of faiths where we go to different um, interfaith programs and um, just have a, a program on it um, that we sometimes do in person. And um, lately we've been doing that virtually and it's um, last year, I believe we went out of country even for that one. So I am now going to turn this over to um, this wonderful lady, Lorana Hughes, who is um, one of our board members and she is an amazing woman in her own right and the different things that she does. And I'll let her explain all about herself and that. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lorana. Um, and I'm gonna spotlight you. Whoops. Thanks, Paula. Um, as I, for those that were in the room earlier, um, I just want to express um, the joy I have with coming and doing these classes. This is the first one this year but I enjoyed the classes that I did through Atlantic Institute last year as well. And so I'm glad to be back again uh, this January as we kick off um, the new year. Um, if you are in the room and did not tell us where you're from, be sure and let us know where you're from. It's um, quite thrilling to see people from all around the world join in for these classes. Um, today, we're going to do, uh, we're gonna be using winter squash, winter squash and sweet potatoes. Um, a little bit about this, I, I am a sometimes farmer uh, and uh, one of my passions is local food and farm to table food and eating the foods that are grown in season. And this is one of those examples. Um, winter squash is typically a squash that's grown in the summertime, but they're called winter squash. They're able to weather over the summer and Lorana, we lost your voice. Lorana. ...of squash that we see in the summer when they're harvested. And these are squash, pumpkin. Those are all kinds of winter squashes and they'll keep all throughout the winter. Um, these are oftentimes a starch staple, that as well as sweet potatoes, which is a, a big crop here in South Carolina. Um, all of the, both of these are things that grow here in my area. And many of those squash that I mentioned are squash that grow in my area. So we're gonna be using those today and do just a simple winter squash medley. Um, the squash that I'm using today are on the sweeter side of squash. So your honey nut, your butternut, the kabucha, some of those are some of your sweeter squash. And then you get into like your acorn squash and those move to the savory side. 
but all of them are good to use for this. And you can mix and match any of those that you have available or that you prefer. I prefer the sweeter ones when I do this, but I also sometimes add in like an acorn squash that's more of a savory that balances the sweetness of this particular dish. Um, talking about how to use it, I'll kind of give you kind of a heads up in advance. Um, sometimes during the holidays, one of the traditional foods around the tables that I grew up was candy jams. Um, sweet potatoes that were oftentimes glazed or candy and baked. Uh, this would be a really nice alternative that lets you incorporate more of the produce that's grown during or for this season. And so this is a really nice one that I use oftentimes in place of that during the holidays or all throughout the winter. It's a really nice um, squash for being able to do that. So today we're gonna be using the butternut squash, but, um, and I don't know if there's going to be a recipe. This is one that you almost don't need a recipe and you'll see as we go through this class. Um, but I'm gonna use the butternut squash and sweet potatoes. I usually add sweet potatoes. Sometimes in my area, I'm able to get purple sweet potatoes. Um, I don't, I find purple sweet potatoes in the times that I've been able to get them, they're oftentimes a little bit less sweet than the orange sweet potatoes. And so I usually don't use like all purple sweet potatoes, but it adds a really beautiful flair when you're doing this um, for your meals to have that extra purple in with the orange. And so if you can get your hands on some of the purple sweet potatoes that are now um, a little more commonly available, then definitely do that. I'm gonna talk about the ingredients that we're gonna to use today. As I said, I use sweet potatoes because for me that adds kind of a base sweetness um, and I'm using butternut squash. You would want to choose, if you were doing a full size baking dish, like a nine by 13, so for a family of maybe four to six or you're having a dinner party for six to eight people, um, I would pick a combination of about three pounds. Um, today I'll be doing about one third, so about a pound of sweet potatoes and two pounds of butternut, but you can mix that ratio as you'd like. Um, this is one that you can weigh it out, but you can eyeball it. You want enough to be able to feel your baking dish. And the choices that you'll have um, is, are really more about presentation. Um, so you're gonna start with your winter squash and sweet potatoes. You're gonna choose some varieties, choose what you have on hand or what may be available at your local farmer's market or grocery store in whatever combination you'd like. We're also gonna use butter. I'm a big fan of butter, but if you are vegan, there's lots of alternatives to that. Um, and you can omit it if you'd like. I particularly like to have that in there. Um, you're gonna have a sweetener of your choice. Uh, typically I will use brown sugar, but for whatever strange reason, I am totally out of that today. And this is one of those recipes that you can use whatever your preference is. Maple syrup is a good alternative sweetener. Um, this happens to be rice nectar that's maple flavored rice nectar. And it just is some sweetener that I have on hand. This is liquid sweetener. You can also use honey if you'd like to. The maple syrup um, or the brown sugar would be more appropriate if you're creating this for those who are vegans versus the butter or the honey. Um, some vegans or vegetarians do eat honey, but some do not. So this is one that's very flexible for that. And for today, I'm actually using a salted butter. Um, cinnamon is one of the spices I'm using today. I'm actually using ginger today. I'm using the powdered ginger, but you could also use um, fresh ginger that you chopped up or grated up in this particular dish. Um, and that's a preference. You can also use spices like nutmeg um, or sometimes in the store, they'll have like a pumpkin pie spice or um, a cinnamon blend spice. Those would be others that would be really good for this particular dish. But today I'm gonna to be using cinnamon and ginger um, as well as the maple flavored um, rice nectar sweetener. Um, I have some honey, I have some maple syrup on hand, but this will do, I don't use this one that often, but this is a nice um, consistency to use for this. Brown sugar is one that I traditionally will use as my main sweetener, um, but use whatever you have on hand and you can modify that to your taste. Um, I also have a little bit of salt. I add just a pinch of salt. I happen to have some sea salt that um, was given to me by one of my friends. 
Um, it's from Colima in South America. And so it's a really interesting sea salt. Um, and it's got an interesting story about it. Uh, it's called Colima Sea Salt. And it's from a cooperative in this community. They harvest this. This is one of their main products. And so it's really nice to use this salt um, with the idea that this is from a farmer collective people that are looking at the resources that they have and being able to make commerce um, out of that. And it's a really nice product. So uh, Rhonda, they want to know how much ginger you're going to use. I'm going to use, if I were using fresh ginger, I'd use about that much. So about a half inch piece of it diced up. Today, I'm going to use about a half teaspoon, a half to one teaspoon of ginger. I like ginger a lot. Um, I, and I might use more than a half inch slice. I might use about an inch or an inch and a half because I like it a lot. And I dice it up really fine if I were using fresh ginger. I didn't have any in my kitchen today. So I'm using ginger powder, one half to one teaspoon for a nine and a half by 11 baking dish. Today, I'm going to use a smaller dish because I don't want to eat that much at the same time. So this is about half size of a, a, not of a nine by 13 um, inch baking dish. So um, you, it'll look like a full size, but I'm doing a half portion. So instead of using three pounds, I'll be using about a pound and a half. So what you see me chop up, um, I'll be about half what you do. And this is a nice size for, like this will give me probably probably about six servings and probably uh, I'll section it up and use it in my meal prep for this week. Um, I don't like eating the same thing every day, but I could eat like the same thing four or five days in a row. So you want a baking dish and you want um, something with a lid or foil. Um, I happen to have a lid for this one that is oven safe, but foil um, during the first part of the baking time, I like to have it covered because that also kind of traps the steam and helps um, your squash cook um, and for the juices to form to give you kind of that saucy glaze that, that um, mixes in with this and makes it so nice. So let's see, other tools that you will need. Um, if you use, if you do things by measurement, um, for those that really like a fixed recipe, um, measuring spoon. Uh, for me, this is one that you really don't have to use precise measurements. Um, a vegetable peeler. I have this one here, a knife. And um, I have an extra bowl here. I'm really big on using all of what you have, using as much of the food as you have available. And so I happen to have chickens here on the farm. And so my peels and the seeds out of um, my butternut squash and the peels from um, the various things either go to my chickens or to the compost um, pile. So I'll have that to be able to collect everything um, that's not the edible portion of it. And so to get started with it, the first thing that we're going to do is peel our items. Any questions so far on the ingredients that we're gonna use today? Um, the equipment that you need, the tools that you need. This again is a really basic, this is something that even very relatively young children can do. Um, a vegetable peeler is not too dangerous. If you were working with children, you definitely want to supervise because it does have a blade that could be dangerous to their fingers if they're not holding it properly. And lesson to grown folks too, you know, be careful with that because um, just where you're holding it, you don't want to slice the top of your finger. It's kind of like a paper cut, it hurts. And so I'm peeling these. They want to know if they can keep the potato peel. Someone likes the nutrients. So if you do, make sure that you wash them thoroughly. So yes, you can, okay? So you definitely want to do that. Today, I'm gonna to do a couple of them. I may need one more, just depending on the size. And then for your butternut squash, what I typically do, I just happen to have a really huge hunking butternut squash that's about five pounds. Um, I went to the store and wanted butternut squash and they literally had one. I didn't really understand that. So you wanna get a pretty hefty knife. The butternuts have a uh, thicker skin. And so this part, if you're doing with children, you might want to be careful because you do need a pretty good knife. I happen to have, this is not a really expensive knife, it's a Cuisinart, 
Um, but this is one I use a lot for chopping. Um, I'm a big fan of butcher blocks and I like have several of them. This happens to be like a four foot long butcher block that I have moved with me over the years, many, many years, and I love it dearly. But this part you might want to do for a youngster just because it's got a bit of a thick skin. Because this is a large one, I'm gonna cut off the top portion of it and that's probably gonna give us enough. Um, but you would scoop the seeds out. Those go in your compost bin as well. Um, most of the time you can find butternut squash that are not quite this large. I'm just cutting off that hard end where the stem is. And I'm gonna do the same exact thing. I'm gonna peel the butternut squash. Um, your vegetable peeler usually works fine on getting the skin off. Um, my vegetable peeler peels really thin, which is nice, but there's a couple of, you know, it will take a couple of passes to be able to get the skin off. And it's kind of like an orange. You take the peel off, but there's still that white part, uh, the rind part, you know, of a watermelon or what have you. I'm cutting off all of that. So all of the, all of the fibery part of the outside and slightly green like under peel. So I'm getting all of that off. And again, this is something that's not a real difficult kitchen skill. And we'll get all of that peel off. In just a moment. And again, it'll go in my bin. It'll either go in the compost pile or to the chickens. All right, so we've got all of that off. Got a little bit of um, the part where the seeds are sometimes has a little fleshy part that's almost fibrous like. So I pulled that part out as well. And then we've got that and that's ready. So I'll clean this off of my space. At that point, we're done. And if you're gonna be preparing this, at this stage of the game, this is when I turn my oven on to about 350. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare these and I'm gonna cut them. This is personal preference. How you cut them, you can dice them if you wanna mix it in. Um, uh, like squares. Um, I sometimes slice mine. And so in this case, I'm going to cut it into a little bit more manageable piece. And then I'm just going to slice them. And then what I'll do is I'll layer them or stagger them in. So this is a little bit firmer. And so if you're doing this with smaller children, this might require a little bit more strength to be able to get through this. So you might want to definitely supervise this if you're comfortable with your children using um, sharp knives. I encourage knife sharpening, even a little $2 off of Amazon knife sharpener keeps your blade nice and sharp, nice and straight. And it really is a safety issue of using a sharp knife. Um, and so you just wanna be mindful of the degree of difficulty this is a pretty firm squash for cutting. So this might be okay if you got a older elementary school, middle school child to be able to do this particular skill, but you do wanna make sure that they're staying focused and paying attention. Um, this may be something that if you were doing this for smaller children, you might take and cut this into, into manageable pieces like this and then cut them into strips like this and then let the children dice them like with a small butter knife or something that would be safer and manageable and less um, risk of injury and do little cubes or little pieces like that. But for today's presentation, I'm just gonna slice these into larger slices. Once I have all of the butternut done, I'm gonna take the sweet potatoes and be careful because they roll. I'm gonna take them and cut them in half as well. And then take those halves and 
I just kind of diagonally slice them. You can slice them straight across. The diagonal slices give you a little bit larger slice. And so I'm just slicing them. Again, the size is your preference. But when I'm cooking, I'm thinking about how these are going to sit on the plate and how people are going to eat them. You don't want big giant hunks. Um, this is one that I'm cutting them with the idea that they're bite size or pretty close to bite size. Um, they'll cook down and be soft enough to be able to cut with a fork. Um, but I'm just mindful of that. I'm big on wanting my food to be pretty. So sometimes I spend a little more time with arranging them. But I'm just slicing these. And I'm slicing these uh, probably a quarter of an inch thick. You want them a little bit substantial because I don't want them to bake down into mush. So thicker slices is okay. But I'm trying to make them a pretty consistent thickness because then they'll all kind of cook about the same time. Okay, so we've got a pile. Um, one of the things I like about this is if you use several varieties of squash, you get different colors. Um, from the video, I'm not sure if you can see the variations of just these two, but you've got a much richer orange with a brighter yellow for these. If you have a variety of other squash, they'll be in varying shades. Um, some um, closer to almost a white and some much more darker um, orange, some more on the yellow spectrum. So it's a really nice thing to have those mixed in. And like I said, if you can find purple sweet potatoes to add that in, it's just a really nice um, mix of colors. So we've got our vegetables peeled. We've got our vegetables sliced. The next thing we're gonna do is really arrange them in the pan. And this is really preference. Um, like I said, sometimes I spend a lot of time doing it because I want it to look a certain way. Um, and I'm just, today, I'm just going to stagger them butternut squash and then some slices of um, sweet potato. Sometimes I do them in a crescent, so it's almost like a circle um, or half circles, but you can kind of do whatever you want. I'm kind of building some walls here and going butternut, sweet potato, butternut, sweet potato, and kind of just filling them in between that way. But you could dice these like, like a hash would be and intermix them. Um, if you've got several different kinds, it sometimes is nice to have the contrasting of colors. And sometimes I'll slice them and then layer them. But it's all personal preference at this point. This has nothing to do with the taste um, of them. It's just about what you want to look like. So you can take as much time or you can just throw them all in there together and cook it. It'll still taste the same. So it's totally up to you. So I'm just taking these and layering some layers of sweet potato and then butternut and then more sweet potato and then putting them in there. And then I'm going to go back because I got more butternut squash and I'll put some of those layers in like this. So far, is everybody with me? Is this doable for everyone? This is a super simple, the variation that you bring to it are the extra spices that you may put in. Um, sometimes I, I'll take and add a little bit of orange juice um, to add that little bit of extra flavor to it. Sometimes I'll put pineapple slices in here. Those aren't local here to my area, but I like them. Um, and so I've got these kind of up, oh, those few that I had in there, I'm gonna add them in there too, because there's no need wasting those little pieces. And what we've got basically is them placed in your casserole dish. So far, this is doable, I know for everyone, even if there's non-cooks out there. So I've got that in there. You layer yours in however you like to. That was just enough. Those couple and the piece that I cut off was just enough for this particular size dish, which I said was like half size. So that's the first part that I do. Then I usually add just a little bit of salt. Salt is kind of like one of those things that helps to enhance flavor. And I have found that it makes a difference if you don't. And so I put just a little bit, um, in the South, they call it a pinch of salt. 
It's probably a fourth of a teaspoon of salt and I'm using a salted butter so that has a little bit more salt to it. Um, but again, for diet reason, uh, dietary reasons or health reasons, you adjust that however you like. I just find that it's a little bit bland um, without that. Um, oftentimes food may be a little bit bland to me if it doesn't have a little bit of salt in it um, to bring out those flavors. So I add just a little bit of that to it. Then, as I said, butter is one of the things I like. This could be a margarine, um, a plant-based butter alternative. It could be any of those kinds of things that you choose. I'm actually gonna use butter. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply gonna slice these into little pats of butter, about a quarter inch thick. They're probably about as thick as the cuts that I made of the squash. And I'm gonna use about, um, typically for a baking size dish, I'd use about five tablespoons. For this, I'm just gonna use a couple of tablespoons because this is a smaller one. But I cut them into pieces and then I just, intersperse them into my dish, lay them on top. I just kind of, since I've layered these, I just kind of push them in. They want to know if you can drizzle olive oil instead of butter. You can, I don't, I, olive oil to me changes the flavor a little bit. I would suggest something like an avocado oil, um, that has a much more neutral kind of flavor, still plant-based, but a neutral flavor. Sometimes, depending on the grade of olive oil that you get or the brand, it may have a flavor that's a little bit different. But if you like olive oil, um, feel free. And you can omit this if you'd like as well. I think the butter and the sweeteners kind of work together to give you kind of the decadence of this, partic this particular simple dish. Um, I'm of the school that says butter makes it better, but not everyone is. So again, this is something that you can change and alter to your particular taste. So that's what I've done. A couple of tablespoons of butter in there. Um, for the recipe people, about five tablespoons is what it would measure out to be in a full-size baking dish. But again, all of that is preference. This is one of those that you really don't need a recipe. All right, so we've got a little bit of salt, just a little bit. We've got our butter in there. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to use cinnamon. Um, this happens to be Saigon cinnamon. There's a lot you can Google about cinnamon and real cinnamon versus not real cinnamon and Saigon versus Ceylon. But this is what I have on the shelf. That's what I'm using today. Again, you could use nutmeg. And what I'm doing is I'm just sprinkling this. If I were dicing these and using more of a hash kind of dice, um, I might put all this in a bowl and mix it in. But a little bit of cinnamon on top of that. And just a little bit of ginger because I like it. You can omit the ginger. You can add any of the other spices that you like. Um, some other savory spices that go really nice with this would be like rosemary. That would be one, <laughs> if I thought about it, I would have gone and got a sprig out of my garden because I do have rosemary right now and add some of that in. Um, so we've got that in place. Is everybody with me so far? Any questions so far? Everybody good? Following through? So then this is where I would add my sweetener. If you have brown sugar, which is what I would typically use if I was doing this, I crumble brown sugar on there, about four to five tablespoons of that. But today I've got this, um, this is an organic rice nectar that's actually maple flavored. So it's just an alternative sweetener. It would be the same as using maple syrup. It would be the same as using honey. Um, you could use any of those things. If there's some dietary reasons uh, why you don't use those, you could do things like um, orange juice. Uh, and if you have fresh orange juice, that would be great. Uh, but you could also use uh, the orange juice. And for this particular dish, when I've done orange juice um, and I didn't have fresh oranges, I would use the orange juice concentrate like you get in the freezer. 
It's the concentrated version. And I put two or three tablespoons of that on top. And because it's the concentrated version, that would give you um, more of a fruit sweetness, the sweetness from the fruit. Um, but today I'm using the rice nectar because that's what I have on hand or one of the things I have. Lorana, if you can hear me, we've lost you. Oh no. All right, I'm trying to get Lorana back. It seems that her computer threw her out. Um, if everybody will just uh, hold on for a couple minutes. I'm in contact with Lorana. There she is. She's coming back in. <laughs> Oh, you guys are great and patient. Okay, I think I'm back in. Am I back up, Paula? Give me some verbal cues. Yes, you are. All right, thank you guys for being patient. Um, something's happening with the other device, so we'll just switch it over. All right, so I left you guys with adding the sweetener. So far, any questions with that? Any questions about the variations, any questions about the combination of things that we've got here on our table. Yeah. They wanted to know if they can mix the sweetener and melt the butter and the spices and put it all together and then drizzle it over or maybe coat the pieces that you, way so it's evenly done. You absolutely can. You absolutely can. So any of those are your choices. I do mine this way because um, I oftentimes like to arrange it. I don't want my stuff all over my hands. And so I'll come back later and the liquid that forms in the bottom, I'll oftentimes baste it. And that's the way that it kind of helps it to incorporate. About halfway through, you'll have the liquids that'll form as it begins to cook. And I'll take my spoon and just baste it like you would baste a turkey or roasted vegetables or something like that that have a sauce on it. So um, I have one person that says lighter dark sugar. And um, will you just touch it that you can use anything? You can use anything. You could use white sugar if you wanted to, light brown, dark brown sugar. Um, usually when I do this, I'll use dark brown sugar or I'll use maple syrup or I'll use honey. I'll use what I kind of have on hand. Sometimes I want that mapley flavor. Um, sometimes I like the honey flavor. Brown sugar is kind of the standard for candy yams. So it's, 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 it's a taste thing. You can use any of that. Um, you can use sugar alternatives. I personally don't use a sugar alternative. I have some allergies. And so I'll use one of those particular sugars, raw sugar, 
Um, there's lots of other alternative sweetener blends. You can use any of those. Um, this is one that uh, the simpleness of this is you can mix and match everything and come up with a really nice, really attractive dish that uses some of the things that you might not um, venture into using. And it's usually one most people enjoy. So um, the real lesson of this is learn to play with your food. Some days I'll put some fruit juices over it, whether it be pineapple or orange or things like that. You can do any different directions. Same with your seasoning. Cinnamon and ginger are two of the ones that I use consistently um, because I, I, you know, those are ones that I like. Um, but I'll do this with nutmeg. I'll do it with like an, uh, um, a pie spice kind of feeling. I think I have an apple pie spice blend on my shelf that's cinnamon and nutmeg and those kind of warm, you think of those, when you smell them, you think of, of, of winter time, you know? Um, all of that is a preference. Um, again, I said, this is one that you can do with no real recipe. It's a lot of eyeballing. It's fill your dish up, put some sort of butter or, or, or fat in there. If you choose, add a sweetener and then we're gonna bake. So once I get to this stage, we're ready for the oven. Hopefully you've had your oven on. The oven has warmed up. Um, if you have a tight fitting lid, if not, I put something like um, foil. I like for the first 45 minutes, I like to have a tight cover because you don't want it to dry out. And really I wanna collect those juices that cook down from the liquid in my sweet potato and my squash. Um, there's some squash that have a higher water content. Butternut would have a higher water content sometimes than like my acorn squash. So um, this adds uh, to keeping that moisture in, which mixes those together with kind of that big sauce for this. So once you've gotten to this stage of your cooking, you're ready to put this in the oven. I am one that I lose track sometimes of what I've done. So I set my timer and I set my timer for 45 minutes because after that time that I'm gonna take off the foil and usually I let it bake for another 15 minutes because what will happen is those sugars that are mixed with that butter and that liquid now will kind of get a little bit of caramelization on the top. It'll kind of brown up a little bit on the top. And so that's what I like doing. What's, what's the temperature on the oven, Verona? 350 is usually what I use. And I usually preheat the oven. Um, 350, put it in, 45 minutes, take your foil off. And today, da 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 da, through the magic of pre planning, I have, I thought, I wish I had some special effects that I could put in. And so in this particular, and you see, okay, can you see that first of all? And as I was explaining to you, those liquids, the butter and the sugar create this almost like syrup. It's a sweet, but yet not so sweet. And you get this syrup that's almost like a glaze and I will usually come back, usually right before, right as I take the foil off and I'll take those liquids and I'll just baste the rest of that particular squash. And as you see, that last little bit of cooking browns up some of those sugars. And in this one, I just took the slices and layered them, butternut and sweet potatoes. And I wish you could smell it. Just take my word for it, it smells really, really good. And what you end up with is a really nice, simple, but very tasty side dish. Um, this is one of those things that for people that are beginners in eating varieties of food, sometimes people get in a rut and they don't know about all these different squash and what to do with them. This is one that I say is a fail-proof way to be able to begin using those different kinds of squash you see, especially all through fall leading up to spring. Um, go out and explore, pick one or two that you don't know that you've never used before. This would be a really good dish for trying this out. So now you've got this, 
This is not a whole meal. What would you do with this? This is a really nice one. Um, and I'm gonna make suggestions for those that eat meat. Um, this would be a really nice side dish for um, roasted pork. Easily to be able to done holiday time, turkey would be a typical thing that you'd have. And this would be a side dish that would go along with those typical meals of turkey or ham during the holidays. Um, this is also something that could be an accompaniment to any vegetarian meal as well. Uh, but like me, sometimes you'll have dinner and then you have this left over. And I thought one of the things that I'll talk to you about is about really playing with your food and experimenting. Um, one of the other things that can be done with this particular dish, um, sweet potatoes and your butternut squash are things that you can drop into a smoothie. So if you had leftovers and you're a smoothie person, this would be a nice way. Um, I'm one that I don't mind green stuff in my smoothie, but I like to have like some sweet fruit or some other things like apples or cherries or something like that that kind of gives it a little sweet taste. This would be something that the leftovers would be something that you could just drop right into your um, uh, smoothie. Uh, raw sweet potatoes are one of the things that are another good thing. So if you've got leftover sweet potatoes, once you dice everything, maybe you've diced too much, those extra sweet potatoes can go into a smoothie as well. Um, but one of the things that I do with this oftentimes is I do this as a dessert. So if you think of something like a sweet potato pie or a pumpkin pie, I would take, because pumpkin might be one of the things that you put in here, you might do sweet potato and pumpkin and you've got leftovers. I would take the leftovers and if you have uh, an immersion blender, if not, just a simple whisk and kind of whisk it so that it's smooth, more like a custard. And what I do is I'll put uh, crumbled nuts um, and I'll make a topping to go with that. You could use whipped cream, but there's a sweet topping that I use. Now this is totally not health food. So I'm just telling you in advance, if you are working on health issues and sugar is one of those issues, disregard the next five minutes of what I tell you. Um, but if you take this either in the form that it's in or mixed so that it's mashed like a custard. And then what I do is I take one block of cream cheese and one can of sweetened condensed milk. I know it doesn't sound like anything, but if you take those two things together, magic happens. And I would drizzle that over this and um, add either some chopped pecans, because I'm in South Carolina, that's what we do, pecans. Some people call them pecans. I grew up, they were pecans. Um, whipped cream on top of it, and it makes a super decadent, almost like dessert parfait. Um, I'll give you that one. That one is like a magic sauce that, um, when I was doing much more farm to table work, um, it was a way to be able to introduce people to, for instance, a variety of squash, but do it in a different way. Um, this plated with that combination, the half sweetened condensed milk, half, um, half uh, cream cheese mixed together until it's smooth. An immersion stick blender works great, um, but any kind of food processor or a simple whisk if they're softened and it makes a creamy sauce and top that with whipped cream. And you've now taken your leftovers and for maybe another dinner time has created a dessert out of that. Um, my goal is always about helping people to understand the foods that are in season. Um, these are some of the staples of the season. Um, they're plants that grow that are intended to be able to be stored. And so your winter squash, all from late summer, early fall, all the way through spring are really great options for complex carbohydrates. Um, because this is so simple to make, it's something that even in busy lifestyles, you might be able to see incorporating. And for those that are a little bit adventurous with their food, to be able to explore some of the other squash that are out there that really have great nutritional value, um, vitamins and minerals that are beneficial to our lifestyle. This is one of those foods where they talk about eating your foods that definitely gives you opportunities to get your orange foods in, in a way that's tasty, in a way that's not too unhealthy, but you have control over that as well. You can control how much butter, or if you put butter or an oil component at all, you can also choose how much sweetener 
you put in this particular one. <clears throat> to make this a healthier option, I would simply reduce the butter and add like a juice. It could be orange juice, but apple juice would also be one that would be a really nice sweet um, uh, uh, a sweetener for this that would be a little bit more natural. Whether those are oranges that you squeeze fresh, that would be, of course, the freshest. <clears throat> or apples that you put through a juicer and then pour that on it. You also can reduce the amount of sweetener that you put in this. If you're using a fruit juice, you might choose a fruit juice. And if you're using things like sweet potatoes and some of the sweeter winter squash, you might choose to leave out the sugar at, at completely. And that would make this a much more healthy side dish um, alternative for you. Um, spice choices are yours. Uh, cinnamon is just one that goes really nice with this, but you have control over that as well. If you're not a fan of ginger, um, leave it out. Um, if you are a fan of ginger, I encourage you, get the fresh ginger, chop it up, and it makes a nice addition to it as well. Um, this is just one that's a super easy, anytime I do food education during the fall and winter, this is one that I like to do because um, this one is super easy to have a win. Uh, there's a question there about condensed milk, sweetened condensed milk. So not evaporated milk, sweetened condensed milk is a thick, creamy, usually comes in about a 14 ounce can. And I find that the ratio of one can to one block, the eight ounce blocks of cream cheese um, softened is a perfect blend. It gives you a nice savory sauce for doing dessert kind of parfaits that I do with a variety of things that are in season. Any kind of filling, and this could be either in this form or mashed like you would a, a, a souffle or like a mashed potato consistency. And I typically layer it with other kinds of things, crunchy nuts, or sometimes I'll take brown sugar and butter and mix that together with a little bit of oatmeal and bake it like a large cookie and then crumble that up and put on top and do it like a parfait. But sweetened condensed milk and cream cheese, mix those two and then top it with like some real whipped cream um, and it makes a nice dessert. And then let your guests ask you, oh, that was delicious, what was that? And you say, winter squash, what? I just ate acorn squash as dessert? Yep, you sure did. Um, and so these are ways to be able to introduce healthy foods or varieties of foods um, and be able to eat in season. One of the things I'm very passionate about is supporting local agriculture. And for me, the education piece is about people need to know what grows in season in your area. And then what do you do with it? How do you eat it? How do you make it tasty? How do you make it so that you want to eat it? Um, questions? Nope, they're just wanting the recipe. So I need you to send me the recipe. And anybody who emails me, I put my email address in the chat uh, about four times now. If you email me your uh, email address, then I will email you the recipe later next week. Um, the YouTube chat, uh, video will also be out there next week so that you can uh, play and stop and play and stop and that sort of stuff. Um, I know when I'm watching a video on cooking, that's what I do. Um, any other questions? And I'll briefly give the, the, the recipe. And so again, this is a half size pan, but for a full size baking sheet, so a 13 inch typically is the baking sheet, you'd want about three pounds, a combination of three pounds worth of squash and sweet potato. Um, one, one pound of sweet potato and two pounds mixture of whatever squash you have, but you can mix and match however you'd like and whatever you have available, but about three pounds sliced, peeled, de-seeded and sliced, approximately five tablespoons of butter and about five tablespoons of sweetener, about a teaspoon of cinnamon and about a half, um, a half to one teaspoon of ginger powder or a half to one inch piece chopped finely of ginger, about a fourth of a teaspoon of salt. And for this particular one, I use salted butter 
So there's a little bit of that salt in there to kind of balance it out and to enhance the flavors of it. Your squash and sweet potatoes, your butter, your sweetener, your spices, and a little bit of salt, your baking dish, and that's all you need for this particular recipe. Any other questions as I plug in? I think I knocked out my charger. I think that's what happened to my other device. The charger, I moved it, it unplugged. Any other questions about this? Does this seem like this is doable? Give me a thumbs up or a yes. Does this seem like something that would be easy for you to be able to accomplish and have a win for in your kitchen? I know it is for me. <laughs> I can't figure out how to do the thumbs up, but I do know that that would be something I would love to do, so. <clears throat> Excellent. Oh, well, Bonnie Brace says hers is in the oven now. Yes, yes. I love those who cook together with me. I love yes. it. I love it. I love it. Send pictures. Go to the Atlantic Institute of Columbia's page. And if you make this dish, send us pictures. Let us know what else you eat with it. Like I'm actively putting out invitations now because not only do I have this one to go in the oven, I've got this one too. So I've got way more food than I need. So I mean, if you're in the area, if you're in the South Carolina area and want to come for dinner and you've got something to bring to go with this, the doors are open. I will set the table for you today. So yes, let us know how that goes. I'm hoping for great success. Oh, I, they're saying your doggy wants some. <laughs> well, well, Delta's my service dog. She's here with me. Um, she, I don't know if she wants to eat this, but she definitely wants my attention. She's doing the nudge nudge. So this is Delta girl. Okay, boom. She's All right, everybody. I think, um, oh, they want to know if you can freeze it. This is one that is good to freeze. What I would suggest if you're going to freeze it, is I would cook it about halfway. I'd let it cool and then I'd wrap it securely. And what I would do is I would take it out. I'd let it thaw before I put it in the oven. I'd preheat my oven. I'd let it thaw. Um, if you were going to eat it for dinner, I might take it out mid afternoon. And then I'd put it in and finish baking it off about the last 30 minutes. Now, one of the things that I find if you par cook it, and then bake it. Sometimes they're a little bit softer, so you get a more, more of a mushier consistency. Um, if you were going to freeze it, my suggestion is to do larger pieces. And what that'll do is when you do that finished cooking, they'll still have more um, firmness and consistency if they're big pieces versus smaller pieces. If you do really small pieces and freeze it, oftentimes you get more of a mushier kind of when you go to serve it they'll be really really soft so go with a larger cut if you're dicing it or slicing it or a little bit bigger if you're going to freeze it but it would be an excellent one to freeze um, and then if it's fully cooked this is one that your leftovers this is an easy one if you're doing meal prep this is one that will freeze re really well um, in like you're, if you're doing meal prep containers or something and you put them in the freezer, this is one that does really nice for that. If you were doing this as a meal prep and going to freeze it in that way, I'd finish baking it off completely, let it cool, put it in your individual containers and put it in the freezer that way. Any other questions about this one? I believe we're done. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Like I said, um, please send me your email address. I have now sent the, my email address and I will send you the recipe. It is super simple, easy. Um, thank you again and um, have a great day. I am going to mute this and um, pause it in case they need to get my email address, but in about 10 minutes, I am going to end this. I am going to stop the recording now as well. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks.